Hello students, in this video we'll discuss the Weierstrass function, which is everywhere continuous but nowhere differentiable. Let's consider the function f of x defined by this infinite series, the sum k goes from 0 to infinity, of b to the power k, the cosine of a to the power k pi x, and I'm going to put some initial restrictions on a and b, right? So I'm going to want here b is between 0 and 1. I'm going to choose a and b later, though. And a is an odd integer. Okay, those are my initial uh, restrictions on a and b. So the Weierstrass m test, these are all continuous, so all the parcels are continuous, right? And so by the Weierstrass m test, f of x is continuous everywhere. f is everywhere continuous. Now I'm going to build some notation over here. So the notation I'm going to build is the following. I'm going to let, I'm going to let d h g of x, this operator d h be a forward differential quotient, right? Is g of x plus h minus g of x over h, right? And so just a lemma about this is that if g has a derivative, I can say that for any x and h, suppose that g is everywhere differentiable, then I can say automatically that d, the largest that this quantity over here can be, is no more than what? By the mean value theorem, there's a point between x and x plus h. So where that's equal to g prime, this is less than or equal to the maximum, the L infinity norm of g. L infinity norm of the derivative of the function, right? So I get that trivial bound just by the mean value property. If this is unbounded, of course, this is trivial, right? But in particular, if g prime is bounded, then I get this um, estimate over here automatically by the mean value theorem. This just falls from the mean value theorem. Mean value theorem. Proof, okay? And so now what I'm going to do is I'm going to break this up into partial sums right over here. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to consider let Pn of x be the sum. k goes from 0 to n minus 1 of b to the k cosine of a to the k pi x. Like that, just the partial sum. And now, of course, this is a nice, continuous, infinitely differentiable function. So in other words, and this, of course, is just a finite combination of cosines. So no, it's it and its derivative are uniformly bounded, right? OK, great. And so what can I say now? And so I can say that if I look at this for, for any h, for any x and h, for any x in r and h greater than 0, what can we say about this dh dh of pn of x? can be estimated, right, by, well, how large can its derivative be? Well, it's just going to be, a, if I do the derivative of this function, I'm going to have a negative sign a to the power k pi b to the k, right? So it's no more than an absolute value, no more than the sum. k goes from 0 to n minus 1 of a b to the power k times pi. That's the largest can be because I'm just estimating, trivially estimating all those signs by one and absolute value. Right, of course, this is just the geometric progression, so this is less than or equal to pi, and it would be a b to the n minus one over a b minus one, which I can majorize by what? I can just majorize that by just a b to the power of n, to the power of n over a b minus one. So that's a trivial estimate on how large the difference quotient for any value of h of the first n minus one terms in this series can be, right? And so now what I'm going to do is look at these remainder terms. What are the remainder terms? The remainder terms over here are of x are just going to be f of x, f of x minus pn of x. Okay? And so those terms are the sum. K goes from n now, n to infinity of b k cosine cosine of a k pi x. That's what these remainder terms are. And now here I'm going to carefully choose how I want to increment it. For any x, I'm going to look at a particular increment. So let's fix, let's fix n and choose m and z such that, such that what? Such that a to the k a to the n, a to the n x minus m is less than or equal to one half. I can always find a point where that's less than or equal to um, 
I can always find the closest integer because no matter what this number a and x is, it's always within half a distance, half a unit away from one integer. So I find that integer, right? If there's an ambiguity, you can just use one or the other, right? It doesn't matter which one you choose. Okay, great. And so now what I'm going to do is I'm going to define, define gamma n just to be this difference, a n x minus m. And delta n and delta n to be 1 minus gamma n over a to the power n, right? And so, of course, I know by construction that this delta n is going to be less than what? Well, if, if this quantity over here, if this gamma n it was equal to negative a half, I would get a what? I get a 3 halves over here. And if it was equal to, um, and if it was equal to what? If it was equal to a positive 1 half, I get a 1 half. So this delta n is between 0 and 3 halves a to the power of negative n, right? a to the power of negative n. Like that. Okay, great. In particular, since a, since we're no, now what can we say about this delta n as n is getting large, as n is getting large, this delta n is getting small, right? So that's going to be my incrementation. All right, excellent. And so now what I want to do is the following. So now we want to estimate these cosine terms um, at x plus delta. So now let's consider the cosine of a of for k bigger than or equal to n, for k bigger than or equal to n, let's consider the cosine of a k pi and then x plus this delta n, which we've constructed over here, delta n. Okay. Well, what's going to happen over here? So let's think about this for a second. So let's modify this a little bit. So what can I say about x plus, um, this x plus delta n, right? So over here, I know that this, um, Delta n is this thing over here, and now there's a relationship over here, so let's, let's expand this a little bit. So what can I say? I can say that a to the n, a n x, is going to be equal to gamma n plus this m over here, right? And then I know that gamma n over, and of course, what can I say about 1 minus that thing over there? Well, I know that, um, let's modify this over here a little bit. So I know that delta n, we can say that what? Um, how should we say this over here? So let's be a little bit more careful. So that's my gamma n is that quantity over there. And so now I'd like to solve for x, right? So x, therefore, x is going to be gamma n over a to the n plus m plus m over a to the n, like that. And now if I add on to this, if I do, so if I say what's x um, plus delta n, that's going to be gamma plus m and then a minus then this plus delta or is this thing over here, then a plus one minus gamma n over a n, right? So this is equal to what? The gamma n's are gonna cancel out now, and you have an m plus one over a n, like that, okay? All right, good. And so now what can we say over here? So now x plus delta n is m plus one times over a n, right? So this thing over here, now what will happen, now this over here is gonna be an m plus one over a n, so this is gonna be the cosine of a to the k minus n pi, and then an m plus one. Beautiful, okay? And so now the whole point is that this is gonna be an odd multiple of the cosine of pi, right? So this is gonna be a negative one to the m plus one, like that, okay, great. And now similarly, what can we say about this thing over here? The cosine of a to the k pi, just plain old x, is going to be what? Well, just plain old x is given by this representation over here. It's going to be, so this is going to be the cosine, the cosine of a k minus n, and then a pi, and then a pi. I got rid of those a to the n's, and then we have a gamma, a gamma n plus m over here, okay, like that. And now by expanding out the cosine, what's going to happen? I'm going to have a odd, if I do the cosine angle addition formula, the terms that have sine are going to be hit at integer multiple pi. So the terms that involve sine in the angle addition formula are going to, be, are going to vanish. The cosine of m pi times anything is going to be a negative 1 to the m. So it's going to be a negative 1 to the m. And then the cosine of a k minus n pi gamma n. Okay, great. And so now, if I look at the difference quotient of this remainder, what's going to happen over here? The difference quotient, if I look at now, let's consider, let's consider the difference quotient d delta n, for our delta n over here, of r n of x, right? Well, it's going to be the, it's going to be the sum, right? And this is going to be the sum 
k goes from n to infinity of b to the power k, b to the power k, and then what? And then we're going to have um, the co this cosine over here, uh, the cosine over here, this term over here, minus this term over here. So what we'll have over here is we're going to have a negative 1 to the m plus 1. Then I have to divide by delta n, right? So this is going to be a over delta n, over delta n, right? And then times this expression over here, times 1 plus what? Times 1 plus the cosine of what? Of a to the power k minus n, and then pi, and then gamma n over here, right? Gamma n. Good. Now these terms over here, this term is, is positive, this term is positive over here. So an absolute value, what can I say? An absolute value, this is going to be bigger than or equal to what? This is going to be bigger than or equal to bk. The, it's bigger than or equal to just the first term in the sum, right? And these terms are always bigger than or equal to 1, right? So it's going to be bigger than or equal to bn over delta n. Or that's going to be b to the power n, of course. b to the power n. b to the power n over delta n. Okay? And now that's going to be bigger than or equal to what? That's going to be bigger than or equal to 2 thirds. 2 thirds by taking the reciprocal of this, a to the power n, b to the power n, like that. Right. Okay? And so now how can I estimate? So now let's estimate the difference quotient of our function at these increments delta n. So it's now our function is rn plus pn. So what can I say? We can say that the difference quotient d delta n f of x, like that, is bigger than or equal to the difference quotient of this one over here, of rn, delta n rn, of x minus, by the triangle inequality, d delta n of pn of x, right? And that's bigger than or equal to what? That's bigger than or equal to a times b to the power of n. They both have an a times b to the power of n over here. Where's our word estimate for this thing over here? Good. And then what? And then 2 thirds over here minus, minus what? Minus pi over a, b minus 1. Great. Okay? Now, what can we say? Now, as long as this term over here is greater than or equal to zero, so that's my final imposition, right? So that's my final imposition is that my choice of A and B needs to be chosen in such a way such that what? Such that 2 thirds is bigger than pi over a b minus 1, right? And so now what that says, that says that, um, so as long as this condition is satisfied, I'm going to make that one final requirement. I know I can always make this happen by letting a get sufficiently large. The larger and larger and larger a gets, the smaller and smaller and smaller this quantity gets over here. So I know that as a goes to infinity, this, this inequality can be satisfied for some odd integer a, right? And so now what happens? So now, by choosing a sufficiently large, I know that um, as long as a times b is greater than 1, which it will be by this assumption, a times b will automatically be bigger than 1, right, by this, by this choice of a sufficiently large. I've shown that as, del as n goes to infinity over here, for this choice of delta, these deltas are going to 0, and this expression over here is going to infinity, right? So I found a sequence of increments where my difference quotient, my function for any value of x is growing as n goes to infinity. So in other words, the limit as h goes to 0 of d h f of x does not exist. In other words, the limit as h goes to 0 of d h f of x does not exist exist because I found some subsequence that was going to infinity for the right choice of a and b. So this, that shows that this function f is nowhere differentiable. No matter what x is, that limit does not exist. So f is an example of a function which is nowhere differentiable, but everywhere continuous. And in fact, there's quite a good number of choices of the parameter a and b for which this happens. So I get a whole two-parameter family of such nowhere differentiable functions. Thank you very much.